Patient and Public Involvement and Engagement, or PPIE, is when we work with members of the public, who we call public contributors, to help us with our research and our teaching activities. PPIE is integral to what we do as a faculty because from our teaching, teaching clinical skills, to our work with science and laboratories, our breakthroughs have the potential to change the lives of millions of people in our communities, locally, nationally and globally. involvement in the faculty is an active partnership between the university staff, be it researchers or teaching staff, and members of the public or public contributors as they're known. I think if we all want a healthcare system that meets patient needs, then involving patients in research and teaching is really significant. It brings that patient voice into the mix so that you've got everybody's perspective and everyone can then work together to try and find new solutions and new ideas and share good practice. Public contributors are involved in lots of different ways and one of the things I really like about the university is they're very flexible in that. So it might be that you are giving some students some feedback on presentations that they've written for the public. It might be that you're helping out with student interviews. You might be sitting on programme boards or health and conduct panels. You might be helping to develop resources or even writing lessons yourself. Public engagement describes the ways in which our education and research can be disseminated to the public because it allows us to showcase the wide variety of work that we're doing both in our research and our education. It's important to engage the public with our work because it keeps us relevant, it keeps our research on topic to the needs of the public and greater society and it also holds us accountable to the public in terms of the research and other forms of higher education that we're doing. The faculty works with lots of different external partners, so for example the NHS, charities like the Stroke Association, cancer research charities and also smaller community groups play a really vital part in informing our research and teaching. Students can get involved in engaging with the public in a variety of different ways and not only is this beneficial for the general public but it's also beneficial for our students because it means they can develop some of their skills in things like science communication which is really important for when they go on to become employed and it also makes the research and the education that they're getting here at the university really relevant to them because they can see how actually this isn't just a dry subject they're learning about. It is something that does make a difference to members of the public, to patients, to people out there in wider society. If you're interested in getting involved with the faculty's research and teaching, then have a look at the faculty website. There's also a digest that you can sign up to that will send you emails and let you know about opportunities that are coming up. everybody to the second virtual PPIE event um, that we have arranged to celebrate PPIE across the faculty. I'm Stephanie Snow, I'm co-chair of the faculty's um, PPIE forum and I'm also the academic lead for engagement and involvement across the faculty. We're delighted to have you with us this afternoon to celebrate five years of PPIE within our faculty. My co-host um, this afternoon is Kay Gallagher, and I'm going to pass over to you now, Kay, to introduce yourself, please. Hi, thanks, Stephanie. Hello, I'm Kay Gallagher. I am, I'm currently the co-chair of the Faculty's Social Responsibility Forum. Um, I've been a public contributor for seven years, but I can't believe how time flies. Um, and it's great that so many of you could join us today. So this afternoon's event, we're going to feature guest speaker presentations and an interactive activity. 
um, and that we're also delighted to announce that we'll feature the outstanding contribution to PPIE awards. Um, so just some bits of housekeeping. First of all, the event's being recorded, but only the people who are speaking are going to be shown. Um, please use the chat function to talk during the event. Uh, we'll have a five minute comfort break about halfway through, so about three o'clock or so. Um, we aren't actually expecting any fire alarms. So if you hear one, the roundup point is probably outside your own front door. And I'm not sure where your toilets are located, but mine's just across the landing. Um, so some key words that we're going to actually use during the event, a public contributor is a member of the public involved in our research and teaching. PPIE is patient and public involvement and engagement. And F, I'd see if I can get this right, FB, MH is the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health. Um, so those are some key words and some ground rules for the event. Um, to share speaking time during the questions and activity, uh, be respectful of others. And there's going to be a short Q&A after the guest speakers who are in attendance, but some, some of them aren't here today, but um, we'll have a Q&A for those who are. And um, to ask a question, can you either raise your hand or write in the chat function? Or I think there's a raising hand on the, um, as one of the symbols as well. So back to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Kay. I think we're going to be as good as Ant and Deck by the time we get out of all the <laughs> social isolation um, ways of working. But anyway, I'm really proud to be opening the event, which has co been co-produced by a fabulous team made up of our public contributors and staff. And it's wonderful to think that we're over 12 months now into the pandemic, but we're still working together and we have so much to celebrate. And it's even more important now that we, we do continue this. So the theme today is celebrating five years of PPIE within the faculty. And we're going to celebrate by listening to a range of experiences, looking back over the five years. Some of you will um, really enjoy seeing the, these photographs um, of all our past events. We're going to hear how specific projects have benefited from PPIE, and we're going to finish with a collective look to the future. The faculty, which was created in 2016, has had its vision at the center of its work and that is to empower people from diverse backgrounds to transform their ideas in biology, medicine and health for the benefit of society in Manchester, the UK and across the globe. The integration of discovery biology, medicine, um, clinical application and patient care within a single faculty, particularly in a region such as um, the Northwest with notable health inequalities, really does give us a real opportunity to have a very significant and positive impact on people's lives. And PPIE is absolutely central to this vision in terms of how we can embed involvement and engagement within our research and teaching. We are the largest provider of healthcare professionals and our research programme includes more than 20 centres of research excellence. So the involvement of public contributors in this work is fundamental to the success of the faculty. And every year, I'm delighted to say we involve around 800 public contributors in different aspects of our research and teaching. In terms of the faculty's remit, we develop and we deliver the highest quality education and training for health professionals and life scientists in partnership with the NHS and industry. We're the largest supplier of healthcare graduates to the NHS in the Northwest, and we conduct outstanding world leading research. We also work with a number of different partner organisations, including the NHS. And I think at the moment we've got about 200 research projects that are ongoing. So it gives you some sense of the scale um, at which we're working. 
And more recently, we've, we've also contributed very strongly to the fight against COVID. So, for example, we've provided over a thousand medically trained workers directly to the NHS. More than um, 200 COVID-19 related research projects were taken up in the first six months of the pandemic. And we moved our graduation processes to allow our student doctors, midwives and nurses to graduate early and join the NHS to help its response to COVID. To fully embed PPIE in the faculty, we have a PPIE forum that Kay and myself co-chair. And this co um, consists of about 40 members, including public contributors. And the role of the forum is to monitor the faculty's PPIE action plan, to give strategic direction and governance, and to really make sure that we make the maximum contribution possible to the university's key strategies, including the public engagement strategy, our future and civic engagement plan. Since 2016, over the five years um, that we've been working like this, the forum has advised on over 30 research funding grants and many more fellowships. We've created a communications network, we've had 85 forum members and have trained over 800 people in PPIE. We've also created resources um, over 40, including public and contributor induction guide, which has already been accessed over a thousand times. And over the course of this time, we've engaged with around 450,000 people through our different events. We've also funded 50 PPIE related projects. And a really important aspect is that we celebrate the positive impact that our staff, students and public contributors make in PPIE through celebration events such as this. So this is the sixth event hosted by the faculty and each year we've had a different theme. So we've focused on partnerships, on well-being. Last year we, we focused on PPIE in a socially distanced world. But this year, um, we're focusing very much on the celebration of the past five years and looking forward to the future. And we're really pleased every year to see new faces, plus people who've been with us for a longer period. This afternoon, we're also going to feature the faculty's outstanding contribution to PPIE awards. In total, we've got 39 awards to staff, students and public contributors. And that really demonstrates the value of the contribution that all these people are making to PPIE. It was a shame we could not manage to do this last year, but this year is even more special because we're up and running and we're, we're doing the awards um, for the last 12 months. So please do stay with us later on when we'll be announcing the winners. So now I'd like to pass back to Kay to introduce our speakers. Oh, hello, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so uh, we've got some really brilliant speakers and some brilliant videos for you now. And the first guest speaker is um, Sheena Krushank, who is the Professor of Public Engagement and Biomedical Science in the Division of Infection, Immunity and Respiratory Medicine. That's got to be one of the longest titles. Sheena was the first professor of public engagement at the university. Over to you. Oh, Sheena's going to present the importance of PPIE at the university during COVID-19 and the faculty's role in the university's public engagement strategy. Public and patient involvement and engagement describes the many ways we share, we involve, and we learn from the public in all aspects of our work. This can take many shapes and forms, including co-produced research, collaborative partnerships, community engagement, and citizen science, to name but a few. And PPIE is absolutely integral to the work we do in the university, whether it be teaching, research, and of course, social responsibility. As a university, we pride ourselves on the way that we are embedding, enabling, supporting, and facilitating excellent PPIE and social responsibility. 
Indeed, in recognition of our social responsibility and our PPIE, we were thrilled to receive the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement's Gold Watermark for Excellence in Public Engagement. And this was particularly because of the support we offer in public engagement. In the Times Higher Education um, impact rankings recently, we were also ranked number one for the work that we do in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that encompasses research, teaching and social responsibility and engagement work. In the Knowledge Exchange Framework, we are within the top 10% of UK universities for our public and community engagement and our research partnerships, which again shows the achievements we are making. It's also a significant component of the Research Excellence Framework, where impact is a very important part. And this is about how we raise public awareness, we change attitudes, we enhance understanding and change behaviour. And this has meant that in the last REF exercise, PPIE actually accounted for 47% of all the REF impact cases across the UK. Now, the awards we gain externally and the recognition we gain externally but also the awards that we celebrate internally within the university show just how committed we are to PPIE and working with and partnering with our communities. The PPIE celebration event is a brilliant example of recognising and saying thank you to all our staff, our students and our public contributors who have all contributed so much to these awards through the PPIE that they do. Within our faculty, we consider PPIE to be a core strength that is placed in very high regard. The main way that the faculty supports our PPIE work is through the PPIE Forum. This features representation from PPIE leads across the faculty, including our fantastic public contributors. The forum provides strategic direction to the faculty's PPIE community through monitoring the forum's action plan. Now, the benefits of including PPIE in our research and our teaching are numerous. As a researcher, it helps us give us more relevant and better quality research. As a teacher, it helps us better communicate and share the benefits of higher education with the wider community. It can inspire existing and prospective students and it can provide innovative new ways to teach. Notably, many of our successful research grants and teaching grants have had strong PPIE embedded within them. And now with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is even more important to involve and engage the public. We need to involve the public in the conversations around biology, medicine and health, tackling their fears about the disease sharing the latest research, involving the public in shaping the research that is prioritised and tackling the misinformation, for example, around vaccines. We all have a role to play in public and community involvement and engagement by helping inspire, share and involving everyone in all the work that we do and the way that it affects our everyday lives. Lovely, thank you, Sheena. We have an opportunity just for a very quick question or two, if anybody would like to ask a question through chat. Um, whilst you're thinking about that, I'm going to put you on the spot, Sheena, if I may, and just ask you um, for a couple of reflections. First, what is your standout um, PPIE moment over the last five years? And what are you looking forward to over the next five years? When you ask that question, do you mean the standout moment from others' work or my work? Just your, your personal experience. What, what's really sort of put shivers down your spine? 
one of the things that actually moved me and the most was when I was um, collating evidence for my research impact um, ref case, in fact, um, an independent uh, researcher went out to the community that I'd been working with for about five, six years, teaching them about infection awareness. And she was doing follow-up sort of questions with the students I'd taught over the years and the teachers that I'd worked with in this adult college. And I hadn't appreciated um, the things that they were doing and how empowered some of the, the, the people felt and that they were sharing the work with their own communities. They were sharing it with their own communities back in the countries where they'd actually moved from. And I was so touched and moved to think that just every little thing you can do might make a difference. And the, you know, people were now acting as vaccine ambassadors. They were acting as infection ambassadors, telling people how not to catch infections. And it was just, it was a delight. It was an absolute honor to, to see that. Um, evidence. I think that's been one of my, <laughs> one of my sort of shivers down the spine. But to be honest, every year, everybody's public engagement work. I just, the, you know, the, when I see everybody's projects, I can't believe what people do. Brilliant. And we've got a question in chat, if we can just do this very quickly. It's from Lamise, and she's asking, when it comes to tackling misinformation about vaccines, have you seen any good websites, resources or approaches that you'd recommend? That's a great question, Lamise. And yes, I, I have. And actually, we've been doing a lot of work on this. So the faculty is doing some really great work. Um, and the British Society for Immunology has actually done a lot on this and they've got a whole section on, on their website with little um, schematics, that pe infographics that people can access. There's webinars giving you advice about what to do, having conversations about public engagement. There's a mass of really good resources and I, I would highly recommend that and definitely look at some of the things that the faculty's doing, particularly the work with Nick Weiss, who's looking at kind of partnering with communities to get things translated into different into different languages because I think that's going to be really important as well. Brilliant, thank you, Sheena. Um, excellent as ever. Um, we can put the links to these different sources of information in in the chat over the course of the afternoon, and then hopefully people can follow up on those. But Kay, I'm going to pass back to you now, please, to introduce our next guest speaker. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so now we've got a joint presentation from three researchers, I'm sure you all know. Um, they're within the Division of Population Health, Health Services, Research and Primary Care. Um, so Claire, Becky, Sally, um, and they're going to present their experience of PPIE over the last five years. Hello everyone, I'm Claire and this is Becky and Sally and we've been asked to share some examples of PPI work that has taken place in our faculty over the last five years and lessons learned. One of the main PPI highlights for me over the last five years has been the Big Data Workshop. Together with colleagues and public contributors, I delivered a workshop on taking the mystery out of PPIE for data intensive health research. This was aimed at researchers who work with large data sets. It came about due to the need to increase awareness of PPIE amongst this group of researchers. Part of the workshop involved a live demonstration of how PPIE can benefit researchers working with large data sets. This showed us that it's possible to do PPIE when working with large data sets. So let's take the opportunity to do as much of it as we can in the future. In collaboration with public contributors, we have co-designed and co-delivered two events which aim to provide people involved in doing PPI, PPIE work, so researchers and public contributors, the space to talk about the challenges that they have encountered along the way and opportunities to help support people to man manage any issues that come up. The events were fantastic with lots of great discussion and ideas. What we learned at the events has changed some of the training we deliver and we now focus much more on what to do if people encounter any difficulties and has led to some changes in policy in terms of how we support people that may find themselves in a difficult situation. 
We will continue to do work in this area to ensure the PPI work we do is of the highest quality and that everyone involved has a good experience when working on the exciting research that we will be undertaking in the faculty in the future. One of the more recent big changes in public involvement is doing more remote and online activities. We've been lucky to advance these approaches together with public contributors and we've learned together the ways to best use the different technologies available to their full advantage. Some of the opportunities from this is that we've been able to involve people who might not be able to traditionally get involved. For instance, if they live far away or they might not be able to take additional time to travel because of health and caring responsibilities. But we also need to consider the people who might be digitally excluded for a range of different reasons and how they may now be excluded from public involvement and engagement work. So it's not a perfect system yet, but as we move forward to more blended ways of working, I think that we will be able to use what we've learned to reach wider and more diverse communities. We think the quality of public involvement over the last five years has been enhanced through all the lessons we've learned. And we very much look forward to the next five years. Thank you so much, Claire, Becky and Sally. That was that was fantastic. And I think it really shows the value of the sort of long term value that comes out of these um, ongoing relationships and the way in which learning can then really be taken forwards to um, to build even better sort of quality ways of, of working. Again, we're, we're open for some very quick questions if people would like to put those in, in the chat. Whilst we're waiting for those, um, can I ask, I'm not sure if we've got Claire Planner with us this afternoon, but Becky, if we've got you or Sally, would either of you like to just say what you're looking forward to in terms of the next five years? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I know Claire's had to send her apologies for today and I think Sally's having some technical issues so okay. I'll answer on behalf of everyone um, but I I think kind of building on where we we've got to we know like I said it wasn't a perfect system but I think you know we, we're working the relationships we have I think are amazing we're really lucky to work with such amazing public contributors and have the support around us to be able to do that and I think that has something that's really developed in the last five years and I think we'll continue to as we go forward um, and I think kind of trying using different technology, I know I mentioned it in the video, but I think that will allow us to engage with people who haven't been able to get involved and hopefully then be able to reach people. We, we've talked a lot about not having as diverse um, involvement and engagement contributors and range as maybe we'd want. Um, and I think that might be one way to help reach a wider audience. But there's so many things coming into the future. I, I, I that's just one off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, but great. But I mean, it's it's good and positive to think that the pandemic has actually sort of catalyzed us into thinking about doing things in a different way, which is producing benefits. Yeah, absolutely. I know it, it's been such a difficult time and, and, and so many things have happened. But yeah, I think it. Yeah, I agree. It's it's seeing some of the positives in amongst in some of the not so great things. Yeah, brilliant. And Jackie's put a comment in the chat um, talking about sort of school with children who um, using online equipment and, and that actually sort of being a, something that allowed de development for that. So on behalf of um, your group and Sally and Claire, Becky, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to hearing from you in five years time. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> okay, Kay, I'm going to pass over to you now to introduce our next guest speaker, please. Thank you. Um, so now we've got Elena Badrit, who's a research associate with the Division of Molecular and Clinical Cancer Studies. Elena presented at our 2018 PPIE clinic um, at the that 2018 celebration event and provides an update on her query about priority setting partnerships for early cancer detection. Really pleased to be talking to you today at the, uh, the PPIE celebration event. I worked on a project that had a lot of support from the faculty PPIE team way back when it began. And um, I'm really pleased to, to give you an update on where we are and, and uh, what the outcome was. So I worked on something called a setting partnership for detecting cancer early. We were, we were really keen to uh, 
to do a piece of work where we generated what people thought the priority should be for early cancer detection, uh, rather than asking researchers what they thought we should be funded. So we were asking patients, members of the public, carers, clinicians, anybody who has any experience of, uh, of cancer early detection, whether they had a cancer themselves or were part of screening programmes. And, um, and then through a series of, of questionnaires and, and narrowing down of, of potential suggestions, we wanted to generate a top 10 of what we think people should be focusing their research on. Uh, but to do that was, was very tricky. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't biased and we didn't have introduced any biases in our in our data and we wanted to make sure we reached out to as many people as possible. So way back when we started developing the idea for the priority setting partnership, we worked with faculty PPIE team and talked to people about um, groups that might be harder to engage with or people uh, who we might need to consider the language we used when we were talking to them and how we promoted the work, where we promoted it, how best to engage people uh, and it was really good for generating ideas about what we should be doing to gather as many potentially unanswered research questions as possible but not only that is for people to flag where if we had one approach we might potentially exclude uh, a group of people who, who had something to say so to make sure we had a sort of a broader um, range of work as possible to include as many research questions as possible. So in terms of an update on the project, uh, we had a really successful project. We had uh, 554 people take part uh, in generating or suggesting potential unanswered research questions that we should be focusing on. Uh, and that was, uh, in total, we realised we had over 1,300 individual research questions that we had to narrow down. We then went through another uh, process of, of questionnaires and uh, of working with uh, different teams to narrow it down and to develop our top 10 we narrowed it down to a group of 26 questions and we had a full day workshop where we invited members of the public and clinicians to basically go from one through to 26 what do they think the most important was right through to uh, not unimportant but not as important as the others uh, and we were successful at doing that and that work uh, was promoted and, and um, published across um, various conferences and it's also been published in the Lancet Public Health as well uh, but without the uh, PPIE team sort of at the beginning and very generous people with their time and their ideas we didn't wouldn't have got the good start that we did and uh, I'm really pleased that we were able to get some some good outcomes and um, I'm sure I can provide you lots of links about uh, about the results and what the top 10 is and the work that we're doing in the future that involves the top 10 that were generated it is being used in research priorities across uh, university and the Manchester Cancer Research Centre going forward thank you Another brilliant example of PPIE. Um, sadly, Eleanor can't be with us this afternoon. So, Kay, can we move on to the next speaker, please? We certainly can, yeah. Hi, um, I'd like to introduce Kate Smith. And Kate's the manager for the Manchester Academy for Healthcare Scientist Education, or commonly known as MAIS. Kate's going to talk about Maze and their PPIE experiences over the last five years. Hello everyone, I'm Kate Smith, the manager of the Manchester Academy for Healthcare Scientist Education, or MACE as I'll refer to it as for the rest of the presentation. MACE is a consortium of universities set up in January 2012 to support the delivery of healthcare scientist training programmes in the North West. We allow trainees who are employed by the NHS to access the best specialist teaching without being restricted to one institution. We currently have over 600 master's level and 300 doctoral level trainees. We place two lay representatives with a programme team and they work together usually for a minimum of three years. This allows lay representatives to embed themselves in the programme and they work in partnership with the academic team. We have a patient forum which brings together all our lay representatives within MACE with the MACE admin and management teams. I wanted to give an overview of some of the involvement that our lay representatives have with the programmes as I expect most people are more familiar with public involvement in research. For our master's programmes, our blood sciences programme lay representatives have developed a teaching session on using lay language, helping trainees translate their research for a wider audience. They then also trained up other lay representatives to run the session. Mason University of Manchester funded a project called the Daily Definition Challenge, 
One of our lay representatives, Lindsay Brown, worked with Joe Pennock and asked a Twitter audience what their understanding was of certain medical terms. The results have been made into a video for our trainees, showing them that even within medical related professions, there isn't always a clear agreement on what terms like gut and protein mean. In the doctoral programmes, lay representatives are involved in marking a lay presentation, which all trainees complete partway through their training. It ensures that the consultant clinical scientists of the future can explain their research to a lay audience and gives them important skills in science communication. Since its initial meeting in February 2015, the patient forum is, has been developed and is now led by our lay representatives rather than by the MACE admin team. Since 2016, the patient forum has produced a handbook for lay representatives within MACE, a role description which was used for the recruitment in 2017, and the Patient Forum advised Lindsay Brown on some of the wording of the Daily Definition Challenge project. I thought I'd finish with a look ahead to the next five years within MACE. However, all these are actually likely to happen in the next year. In January, we're celebrating our 10th birthday and are hoping to host an event to celebrate our successes. This will certainly include some of the work of our lay representatives. Shortly, we're going to be recruiting more lay representatives to fill some vacant posts that have been created over the past two years. Thank you for listening. If you want to find out more information, you can do so on our website or Twitter. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, such an important um, range of work that you're doing within MACE. Now, I know you are here with us, even though your camera um, isn't working, so we won't see you on video. So if anybody has questions for Kate, please put them in, in the chat because she's with us to um, answer them. Whilst we're waiting um, for that, Kate, perhaps you could just reflect briefly on the difference that the pandemic has made to the ways in which you've been working? I think um, it's, it's been really challenging for everybody. Um, what I actually returned from maternity leave in the middle of the, uh, of the pandemic and found, I, I was really pleased to see how many activities were still taking place and how well they'd developed them for delivering online teaching instead. Um, our trainees are based all around the country, so we haven't had any face-to-face -face teaching. Um, and it's really good to see that a lot of the um, activities and sessions that were being run by our lay representatives are still taking place. Um, it's a shame we have had some uh, lay representatives who aren't involved at the moment because, you know, as we mentioned, there is an issue for some people with sort of digital technology um, and I feel like that's been a real shame but I'm pleased to see that we have actually managed to keep the teaching going um, and keep involvement going as much as we can. Brilliant thank you very much Kate and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Kate can I pass back to you please to introduce our next speaker. Yeah thanks Stephanie. Um, so I want to introduce Angela Ruddock. Um, Angela is a public contributor and the current chair of the Primer PPIE group and was one of the first public contributors I met when I started this, this um, role. So uh, Angela won um, the Public Contributor Award at the 2019 celebration and this afternoon, she's going to tell us about her experience of being a public contributor. How did you become involved? I was nearing retirement. That's usually the, the start where you're looking around seeing what else you can do. Um, but I had some experience with my parents who were getting poorly one in particular um, and uh, she had uh, diabetes and I was particularly interested in some of the issues around that because I was helping her navigate through the um, you know primary care system. I met somebody who um, at Salford in fact it was um, the late lovely um, Peter 
who uh, uh, suggested that I um, come to one of the meetings about uh, diabetes. What keeps me involved? I, I always was interested in science and always interested in medicine anyway, and I ended up um, actually doing a biology degree about 40 years ago. Never actually touched it academically, but I think that's... Um, you know, I had a particular interest in what makes people well. One of my um, fondest if not, memories and highlights of the various projects that studies that I had been involved in was um, where we were interviewing um, uh, diabetes type 1 sufferers and we were um, given you know, quite a, a, as I said, detailed training around that. Uh, it was the first time that I'd done any sort of real sort of work or training or understanding of um, diabetes type 1. What is my present involvement? I've always been a Primer member, but um, I was voted chair of Primer about three years ago, and I'm I, I particularly um, I'm grateful for that because... Um, chairing a group of very um, articulate um, people who want to get the news across is, is um, uh, was good training for me, making sure that people who perhaps were new or not um, as articulate managed to, you know, get their views across. Um, as a public contributor, I've been asked to sit on panels to make um, uh, informed opinions about somebody's presentation, whether in fact it has public appeal, whether that they've involved um, people enough in, in the work that they're doing, that sort of thing. Do you have any top tips? Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's what we're here for. Brilliant. Thank you, Angela. You're just such an inspiring example. Um, and it's wonderful to have you as, as part of our community. So again, Angela is here this afternoon. So please, if you've been inspired by that, put the questions in chat. In the meantime, Angela, perhaps I can ask you, how do you reflect on the changes around PPIE over the last five years? Do things seem different now in terms of the way that um, we work compared to when you began? Oh, yes. Um, I have to say, um, when I first joined, that would have been 2009, 2010, when I became a public contributor, it was, um, well, for one thing, you, you didn't see many um, non-white faces. <laughs> um, it's much more diverse now, um, I think. And also, actually, you didn't see as many men. Um, it, it was mostly... Um, it was a bit like a women's institute, you know, when, when, when I first came. So it's much more diverse, um, both in age, in um, um, backgrounds, you know, um, a whole range of things. I mean, we've still got, you know, some way to go, but it's, it's changed market, markedly in the 10 years that I've been um, a, a public contributor. Yeah. Brilliant. And really interesting what you say in that um, many more women in, in the beginning mm -hmm. um, and it was bringing sort of men on board to to create that um, that diversity. What about the ways in which we've had to work during COVID and, and the lockdowns? How have you found that? Oh, it's, it's um, oh, what do they say? It's a Charles Dickens phrase um, of many parts. Um, I can see lots of positives in the sense that um, people who perhaps, um, you know, can't get to meetings and aren't able to travel um, or may have, you know, other difficulties, um, it, it is a lot easier in, in lots of ways, um, if you've got the technology, to um, um, uh, communicate through Zoom or um, Teams or whatever it is. But um, uh, I think there is still, you know, a, a significant amount of people who don't have that opportunity, perhaps, uh, or don't have the resources necessarily to get involved. So we, if, if we can 
now that we know the sorts of things that Zoom can do for us, I'm just thinking when will we go back to whatever new normality is, if we can actually um, invest in both um, opportunities for people who um, you know want to meet. I mean, I, I, I miss the actual um, comradeship and meeting people for coffee and, and the nice sandwiches, of course. <laughs> but you know, it, it's um, it's the it, it's the the one to one contact that we had at the meetings. That was great. I really enjoyed that, and I miss it. Um, but at the same time, I recognise there are people that couldn't necessarily do that. So if we can have a mixture now, now that we we know, you know, what we can do um, to make sure that as many people can engage as possible. Great, thank you. And I think we're all looking forward to getting back to some yeah. <laughs> and cake round a table. But thank you, Angela, for, for all that you do. Kate, okay, can I now ask you to introduce our final speaker, please? You can, thank you. Um, so our last guest speaker is uh, Will Dixon. He's the Professor of Digital Epidemi Epidemiology at the Division of Musculoskeletal and Dermatological Sciences. Um, Will is going to present the engagement project, A Cloudy with a Chance of Pain. Hello, uh, my name is Will Dixon, and thanks very much indeed for the opportunity to speak at this PPIE celebration event. In the three minutes that I have, I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about the relationship between weather and pain, give you an overview of the Cloudy with a Chance of Pain study, uh, giving some project highlights, but in particular, our patient and public involvement and engagement. Here I am in clinic asking one of my patients how they've been feeling. And almost every clinic, at least one patient, and sometimes more, will tell me that they've been much worse what with this recent weather. Now, this is a belief that's been around for millennia, and yet scientists have never worked out if this relationship truly exists. And so in 2015, we wondered whether we could use smartphones to answer this question. The idea was that we could collect disease severity uh, every day on a smartphone app and link to the uh, local weather data using the smartphone's GPS. So collecting disease severity in weather would allow us to examine the association between weather and pain with the potential advantages that we could recruit really large numbers of people, track their symptoms every day across seasons, collect accurate local weather data and follow people up for a long time. Unfortunately, the downside was that we didn't have any experience of running a mobile health study but then at this stage, neither did anyone else. So we thought we'd give it a go. We knew it was really vital that we worked closely with patients. We were asking them to do a big thing in tracking their symptoms every day for six months or more. And so we set up a patient and public involvement group uh, as we started our pilot study back in 2015. And this group was really pivotal in helping us design the study correctly. Uh, and they went on to be really important in our public engagement as well. Uh, the pilot, the BBC learned about the pilot um, during the course uh, of that study. And in fact, they went on to help us launch the proper study in January 2016. And here's Carolyn, our patient partner on BBC Breakfast, really describing the agony that she feels with her own painful condition uh, and was a really strong advocate for the study. Um, this uh, national media coverage together with the patient partnership led to excellent recruitment. Uh, over the course of 12 months, we successfully recruited over 13,000 people. Uh, in fact, it, within the first week, we'd recruited at least one person from every postcode area in the UK. And ultimately we tracked over 5.1 million symptom scores. Now that's a lot of data to crunch through, and so it took us a little while. It was a really complex analysis, um, but and, and, and here you can see one of the real highlights of the, the project was the analysis meetings. Um, but wind forwards three and a half years, and I, together with Carolyn, were back on the BBC uh, breakfast sofa discussing the results, uh, and it had huge media attention on uh, national news broadcasts and lots of other uh, dedicated features. Um, but I'm going to leave the last words to some of our participants, uh, and this was recorded 
uh, to help support the results dissemination. Uh, so over to our participants. Dry, damp, overcast, pressure, Free. a change in the weather, Very warm. raining, it came uh, like an express train. Household chores and gardening are out of the question. It's a horrible situation. Everything hurts and I feel like I'm running out of energy. I won't be able to walk. The research really matters to me. It's necessary for everyone to be aware. Hopefully manage my pain a little bit better. To record six months of symptoms. This could be extremely useful. It might prove that I'm not imagining that my symptoms are worse. Motion is lotion. I think that taking part in research studies helps you gain a little more control over your condition. And if we could put sunshine in a bottle. Rosalie. Roger. Janet. Laura. Belinda. Karen versus arthritis. So thanks very much for listening, everyone. Um, I think I'm going to be there to answer questions, uh, but I hope this short segment has really highlighted the vital importance of uh, patient public involvement engagement, particularly in mobile health research. Thanks very much. Thank you, Will. That was um, a brilliant film. I think you are with us, but I know you said you've got dreadful Wi-Fi. So um, can we just see, can you, can you hear me now? Are you actually um, in contact with us? No, it, it doesn't sound as though we're, we're able to connect to, to Will. I mean, what I really want to know is whether or not his study is going to be able to produce sunshine in a bottle, because I think that's what um, we would all think would, would be a good outcome. Um, but we've got through all our wonderful speakers absolutely um, on track with time. So thank you, everybody um, who spoke and those who sort of put questions in chat. OK, so. So welcome back everybody after our short break and in this part of our celebration we're going to um, enjoy doing a group activity and what we'd like to do is to build on last year when we focused on how to effectively conduct PPIE remotely and we thought about digital technology in PPIE and we're going to be placed in a virtual discussion room with a facilitator so it's a bit like a table discussion discussion and we're all going to have some um, key questions to consider. Then we're going to return to the main room to feed back to the group what we have been discussing. The breakout rooms won't be um, recorded, um, but obviously we're, we're recording the, the, the main event. But now I'd like to very much welcome Jenny Ward, who's research coordinator for the Digital Experimental Cancer Medicine team. And she will be the person leading us through the activity um, this afternoon. She, she'll give us an introduction to the activity. How can PPIE in the health and clinical research setting embrace the new digital world in a meaningful way? Jenny, can I ask you to do the introduction, please? Hello, Stephanie. Thanks very much. I'll just share my screen and hopefully you can see my slides. Yeah, hopefully those are visible. Yeah, I can see those, yeah, that's great. Excellent, thank you. So yes, thanks Stephanie, and thank you to the faculty for inviting me to be part of the event today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Jenny Ward, Research Coordinator with the Digital Experimental Cancer Medicine team. People who make up the team, we are a multidisciplinary team within Cancer Research UK Manchester Institute and you can see the kinds of varied skills that we have in the, the pink box that's displayed in this slide 
and the image shows team members in a meeting rather typical of the last 15 months utilising their digital technology. Today, once I've covered the team as a whole, my focus will be on the te technology clinical trials group highlighted on this slide because we're the group that's had the most um, interaction with PPIE. So as the digital ECMT, we have a vision to digitally empower patients and healthcare professionals to innovate and design new cancer care pathways. This vision has strong links to both digital technology and PPIE. And we simply wouldn't have the chance of achieving our vision without the invaluable support from the PPIE community. We work closely with the experimental cancer medicine team based in the clinical research facility at the Christie. And as part of our mission, we want to transform clinical decision making, evolving the role of patients to include them as co-researchers and improve patient outcomes. Digital technology has become a tool used regularly by so many, particularly over the last year or so. Uh, so why wouldn't PPIE embrace it and capitalise on reaching more people in more places by hosting events in the same way as we are here today? So I'd like to share some of the ways that we successfully use digital engagement and technology. A technology clinical trial is a way of evaluating technology in its broadest sense. So medical devices, digital, digital, gosh, digital healthcare products, software systems. And we want patients to become co-researchers with us they can monitor specifics at home to potentially improve their quality of life on trial and to provide additional clinical data or feedback. A clinical problem or need is the first step towards designing a technology trial and our trials will test the proof of concept of that technology. Participants can tell us what's acceptable, usable, practical, relating to a device or frequency of monitoring. And trials also enable clinicians and consultants to test the value of additional patient input and information about the effects of treatment on the patient. So I'll follow with an example of a trial which used PPIE to inform decisions during its design. The clinical problem or need with the notion study, the, the trial in question is, detection of immune-related toxicity in patients receiving immunotherapy. We propose to do this by patients sampling very small amounts of blood in their own home to test for proteins called cytokines. The diagram here shows the pathway that the study will test the proof of concept of. So home monitoring includes a finger prick, a small sample of blood is taken, by the mitra device, the, which is essentially the white stick visible in the purple casing on the image. Samples will be posted back to the lab weekly for analysis. Patients don't have these results in real time and therefore won't have their treatment changed. We're testing the proof of concept and it's hoped that a successful study could lead to a care pathway change intended to benefit both the patient and the clinic. So the patient engagement within the, the planning for the notion study, we had several patient engagements during the concept design and planning stages. Some took place in the traditional focus group manner with a group of volunteers face to face. Last year, some groups could only take place via video conference and that was what we did in August. But nevertheless, we were able to share detailed content for attendees to feed back on. The method worked really well and confirmed to us that face-to-face -face isn't always necessary to get valuable input. Feedback and comments from participants across all the sessions added value, detail and clarity, enabling us to design a study which we believe will ensure the optimal compliance by those taking part. For example, the patient information sheet was changed to become more user-friendly, involving more images, an emphasis of po positive wording, which was less intimidating to the participants. Sometimes I think the, the areas that we think could cause the biggest issues could be completely wrong. We anticipated problems with the sa sampling frequency. Uh, groups told us that they would happily provide as many samples as we wanted to inform our research. 
the manufacturer also offered two different casings for the sampling device. Participants had a chance to handle both of these in a face-to-face -face group and give their view on the best for all dexterities, selecting the purple clasp style one shown on the last slide. So we're trialing a completely new process with Notion, including posting samples back to the lab once per week. Clear user instructions were key. For example, the language used, images, access to a video for reference were all things that were suggested. Labels need to meet laboratory standards of compliance and also be produced in triplicate. As a result of group discussions, we agreed on inclusion of a completed label for reference for the individual. So the patient voice enables us to consider the smaller, more detailed aspects. So important not to brush over that, that could really make the difference between participants being willing to take part for the duration of the study or leave part way through. So we're really pleased that Notion, which will start recruiting soon, has received positive comments from the sponsor and the Regulatory Ethics Committee on the quality of patient literature and kit instructions. And this is due in no small part to the PPIE that we've undertaken and the huge contribution in person and remotely by focus volunteers who we've engaged with. Thank you very much for listening. I'd now like to hand back to Sam. She will be organising the breakout rooms, I believe, to discuss the topics that she shared with people at the end of last week. And I hope to drop into each room to join the discussions for my own research. Uh, so I look forward to seeing more of you shortly. That's about everyone back in the room. So thanks very much, everyone, for doing that. Um, I'm going to do the feedback for this. So what I'm going to do is we had four breakout rooms. So I'm going to ask our facilitators to give some feedback um, in the following order. I'm going to ask Moira first, then Nick, then Georgina, then Angela. So if you could, um, on behalf of your um, breakout room, if you could feedback with one key thing that you've learnt, what was the overriding comment in your in your session and one top tip. Okay, so can I ask Moira to start, please, for her breakout session, for her breakout room? You can, but I didn't actually take any notes. Sam has all the notes and I can't see them. And I'm, I have to confess that I concentrated more on making sure everybody had a chance to speak rather than maybe listening as hard as I should to what they were actually saying. So forgive me if I miss everybody's point. Um, one, one thing that I remember that is very important is to be aware of the possible situation of the people that are in the room. Um, you don't know what difficulties they may have with the technology or whether um, they are conversant with what they're doing and how easy it is and whether they can they're sighted unsighted have any other physical problems or so that was one thing to take very carefully um i think now top tip i know we had one top tip at the very end sam can you remind me <laughs> i can't remember what the top tip was it's just about making sure that everyone is included and that we go to a hybrid so it's not all going to be uh, remote. It's going to be um, potentially blended just to make sure that everyone is included. Yeah, that, yeah, well, that was yeah, pretty much. And also not to forget that we are social animals, however much we may get um, enamoured of the digital approach. We have to remember that we are actually people who like to meet face to face as much as we can. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Moira and Sam. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move over to Nick now, um, and I know Nick was talking, you, you were looking at ethics, privacy and safeguarding and support and top tips. Nick, over to you. Oh, thanks, Howard. Um, yeah, we had a great, real, uh, really meaningful discussion, actually, about uh, ethics. Uh, so uh, we thought that um, it's really important to understand people's preferences in order to, to uh, establish me meaningful involvement. Um, and that goes right through to staff uh, as well as public contributors. Um, we've still got a lot to learn. Um, and I think one of the common 
common themes that are really coming through is the fact that everybody needs guidance, uh, no matter who you are. Um, so there was a great comment in relation to um, not knowing there was a whiteboard feature on Zoom to collect people's insights there and then live. Um, but that, then that brings other um, accessibility um, issues in terms of people who like to see big size font. I know in my group, they're quite keen to have large font and they're not keen on trying new technical things out. They just want things, you know, it's have a, just a meaningful conversation and actually have really, really appreciate having that shared space um, to talk through through the issues and the work and, and just really just to connect to people in a meaningful way. So um, I just think it's really important to have some sort of strategy going forward from the start to embed people's experiences and preferences throughout the work, no matter whether that's a short or a longer term project. So that I guess that's the, the top tip really from our group. Um, and then the other thing was, uh, I think, basically that we're all in the same boat and uh, we really need to remember that <clears throat> and it, as we move forward to what we call hybrid working um, it will be really interesting to try and um, collate our experiences stories of how we've managed the challenges that we've encountered um, I know for me with my group I'm doing that at the moment and we're we're um, actually talking at academic conferences about our experience as a virtual PPIE and I just think it would be brilliant if the faculty could do something similar. I know the NHS 70 stories are doing that as well but if we could produce something I like the idea of the top tips. So yeah lots lots of ideas but that's uh, um, in a nutshell. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. Kay you were taking notes. I don't know if you want to add to that. Is Kay there? <laughs> Or uh, Lamise? <laughs> I think you've covered it. Great. Sorry, sorry I, I was, guess oh. what, I was muted. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think the thing that came out for me was the fact of don't take anything for granted on, yeah. on both parts. For um, yeah. academics not to assume that public contributors know what's happening and for public contributors not to make the assumption that the academics have got the whole thing sussed either. Absolutely um, and it's and a it's, really good time to co-produce resources that's what came through wasn't it? Yeah yeah, yeah yeah great thanks Kay. Oh, that's brilliant so we're all in this together I think is the um is the theme there, isn't it? And going back to what um, Moira was saying as well about including everybody is absolutely essential, isn't it? Um, so thanks, Nick's group. Um, I'm going to move over to, to Georgina now as well. Uh, Georgina, Hi, your um, group. Uh, yeah, I guess ours um, and anyone else from the group can kind of jump in. I guess ours echoes what other people have said really in terms of, that we've all kind of had to adapt to um, adapt to using digital platforms and um, that when we move back to, or kind of if we move to blended um, kind of um, PPIE going forwards, that I guess kind of allowing time and, and training for that, and um, because it's not necessarily something um, that people who are running kind of these sessions or running kind of training themselves are experts on that we're all kind of having to adapt as we kind of change to different platforms. And a key message from our group really was the difficulties in moving between multiple platforms. Um, so if lay members are kind of familiar with Zoom, then having an event on a completely different platform or on Teams, et cetera, that it's obviously kind of, it's completely different. It how the kind of system or computer you use um, can kind of run differently depending on kind of which platform you're using. Um, and I guess having key contacts as well with it. So if you're running an event, ideally, you kind of want an email address or a phone number or someone uh, that people can kind of contact if things go wrong, rather than just sitting at home, not being able to access different parts of an event. Oh, that's perfect, thank you. That's absolutely great. So last but not least, Angela, your group. Hi. Well, we were very least. I'm afraid I didn't share it very well because we only concentrated on one area, but 
having said that, they do bleed into other areas. So, um, um, and uh, it was, um, I think, well, Stephanie, you were taking the notes, weren't you? I think. So if I forget anything, <laughs> um, um, please jump in. Um, well, I think the first discussion that we had was um, the actual kind of, I think the, the, the last um, facilitator was, was saying that, that being used to one type or another type of uh, platform was the first um, um, comment made was that how awful Teams is compared with Zoom. And uh, we, we started sort of generally making uh, complaints about that, but it was just myself and, and one other person that had obviously bad experiences. But I think the issue is there, the, the general issue is, if you're not used to um, any of these systems, uh, uh, it, it, you won't get used to it the first time you use it. There will be all sorts of problems. So um, it's always good to take bear that in mind. Um, we did talk a lot about um, people who will have, not, it's not necessarily older people, but people who have different um, um, uh, issues, um, either sight, hearing, um, who will be um, uh, affected particularly um, with uh, uh, different types of um, uh, digital engagement. Um, have, we have to recognize that it takes time, obviously, for anybody to sort of learn um, you know, the foibles of these things. And I've had experience myself where you know, I've been involved in, in interviews, actually it was, um, and I was invited to sit as a public contributor on an interview and my wi-fi went um and and the, the, the sheer panic I, I i had um when in fact what would have helped was the point that somebody else said there about having email addresses um yeah. and having a phone number um so you've got a different way of communicating if something catastrophic uh, or you think is catastrophic happens um it's that sort of fear that 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 you know, obviously um, affects people more than anything, but it's a secure, it's knowing that you, there are people that you can call on if you've got problems. So that, that is definitely an issue. Um, and um, I think there was another issue also, again, about people who have language um, um, difficulties or different language or different um, cultural groups who would not necessarily, you know, would need additional support perhaps in, in um, um, listening, um, understanding what, what um, people are saying. That's as far as we got really, but I think all the issues that have been mentioned before are things that we would have, if we could have had a bit more time, would have said. Absolutely, no, no, Angela, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm, thank you very much everybody for your input in a similar way to how what we did last year, we will take all of these notes um, from this and then they will feed into our resources, our new next set of, or the next iteration of resources that we'll create and top tips and things for people to consider because I think it's come across that it's all about including people having a backup, always having a plan B as well in this new digital or um, the new hybrid or blended world, whatever we call it, that we're all entering now. Um, and I, can I just say as well, thank you so much to Moira, Nick, Georgina and Angela for facilitating so wonderfully. And on that note, I'm now going to hand back um, to Stephanie for the next section of the celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harris. That was, a, that was a really great activity and I think we'll be able to take a lot of those things forward over the coming months. But now we're coming to the heart of the celebrations. And this is our PPIE Awards for 2021. So once again, we're able to recognize the inspirational and the outstanding commitment of PPIE through the faculty and these awards. We had a lot of nominations. They're all of extremely high caliber. And we want to thank everybody for their continued dedication to PPIE, particularly over the last difficult um, months with the, with the pandemic. We've had got six award categories. Some categories include a highly commended award as well as the winners. 
And we're also including special COVID-19 awards for those who've gone over and above during the pandemic. But before we move on to the awards, we want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to one of our public contributors who very sadly passed away last year. And I'd like to introduce Lamise Hassan, who's a research fellow within the faculty who worked with Alan Campbell to say a few words. Thank you, Stephanie. So it's an absolute privilege for me to introduce the next part of today's event, which is a short film in tribute to the life mm. and contribution of Alan Campbell, who sadly passed away in November. I came to know Alan through his role at HAPI, which is the Healthy Research Centre's public involvement group. And Alan was our first lay chair and the founding member of the group. And he used his life experience as a health counsellor and someone who lived with diabetes to advise on many of the research projects we ran using health data. Of course, that wasn't the only volunteering that Alan got involved in. And those of you that know Alan, which will be many of you, will remember how tirelessly he worked for the many causes he believed in. On a personal level, I knew Alan as a confident, bold, sometimes cheeky character with a broad smile. He made friends wherever he went, but he also wasn't afraid to challenge the status quo. And it's only now really since that Alan's been gone and seeing the response that I'm realizing just how widely he was known and respected throughout the university, but not only there, throughout the wider health research community and the diabetes care community too. Lastly, just before we played the video, someone pointed out to me recently, if we'd been on campus, I'm sure we might have noticed his absence. And that perhaps is just a reminder to us all. It might have got a bit harder in recent times and none of us seem to be getting any less busier, but we've got to fight to continue to stay in touch with our friends, families and colleagues and everyone who matters to us and support each other however we can. Alan, this video is for you. We miss you. We would like to recognise the contribution of Alan Campbell to improving the health and well-being of the citizens of Greater Manchester and beyond. Alan sadly passed away in 2020. Through his exceptional commitment and drive, Alan made an incredibly positive difference through championing patient involvement in research, education and NHS services. His unfaltering courage to speak up meant that patients and carers were equal partners. Alan was particularly passionate about the award-winning Data Saves Lives campaign, highlighting the positive impact of health informatics research on public health. He embodied the Greater Manchester spirit, being a passionate advocate of communities working in partnership to everyone's benefit. We will miss Alan very much, However, his memory will no doubt live on through our ongoing work. And that's a wonderful um, record of, of some of Alan's contributions. I first met Alan when I took up my role four years ago and he was my first um, co-chair for the forum. And I really did value the support and the confidence and the sheer enthusiasm that, that he contributed and helped me settle in. So we do miss him very much. I'm also very sad to say that um, we have further sad news about the passing of Peter Donnelly. Peter was a very much respected, liked and admired member of our patient and public involvement community. He dedicated many years and huge amounts of energy and knowledge towards improving research and service design and delivery for the benefit of patients, carers and communities. And despite becoming very ill with cancer, Peter did not stop his commitment and he continued with determination right to the end. And I think we will always remember that as well as the great humour and friendship shown to everybody. And so we do send Ailsa and his family all our love and best wishes at this very sad time. But now I am glad to say that we're going to be joined by guest speakers to announce the awards.
Hi, I'm Mike and I'm a public contributor. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the newcomer category for people or groups who have been doing PPIE for less than two years. For this category, we have one award winner. The winner is a non-profit initiative launched last year by a group of scientists from the university. They are devoted to providing equal access to science for everyone and believe passionately in effective science communication stroke public engagement. The award goes to Live with Scientists. My name is Marie. I'm a public contributor. The next award is the one-off project or event category. For this category, we have one COVID-19 award and one winner. The COVID-19 award goes to a team who sets out to understand the experiences of people living with dementia and their carers. They conducted online discussions where they talked about the challenges during the pandemic. Through these discussions, they discovered they were able to proceed with their research and also the significance of technology during this period of increased isolation. The award goes to Dr. Karen Davis and the Living with Dementia during COVID-19 project team. The winner of this category engaged with patients support groups and gynecological cancer charities to help shape their research. They carried out a nationwide survey of women with Lynch syndrome and clinicians involved in their care. This triggered a nice assessment of their evidence, which led to guidance that all womb cancer patients should be offered testing for Lynch syndrome. The award goes to Dr. Emma Crosby and the Let's Talk Lynch team. My name is Professor Sheena Cruikshank and I'm an immunologist based in the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health. And I'm also the academic lead for public engagement. Now, next, we have the student category. And for this, we have one COVID-19 award one highly commended and one winner. I'm delighted to say that the COVID-19 awardee led to a new innovative social media campaign that aimed to help healthcare professionals and students on clinical placement. The campaign enabled healthcare professionals and students in clinical practice to communicate much more effectively while wearing face masks. The award goes to the smile behind the mask. Another fantastic award is the highly commended award. This goes to a student who originally joined the spatial team to complete the work placement as a requirement of their degree. On completion of their placement, they offered their time to continue to support the study through a range of activities. This proved invaluable in the pandemic. The award goes to Jessica Hay. The overall student winner has shown a continued passion and a commitment to involve individuals with lived experience throughout all stages of research. This is commendable given the lack of involvement of prisoners in research. Their work resulted in co-produced sets of guidelines which have pioneered the involvement of individuals with lived experience of incarceration in research. The award goes to Laura Hemming.
I'm Mahesh Nirmalan, and I'm the Vice Dean for the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health, and I look after social responsibility and public engagement. In this category, we have got three different awards. The first one is the category specific for the work related to COVID. Then we have another highly commended award for general patient public involvement and engagement. And then, of course, the third is the final winner. The COVID-19 award for the staff uh, is meant to recognize people have gone and done exceptional things uh, to meet the needs of our student and the community in, at the time of this pandemic. Uh, and the first award goes to a person who used their imagination to find alternative arrangements for people who were special high-risk categories to meet their training requirements in the clinical arena by finding alternate arrangements to do clinical placements. Because as you know, the clinical placements are essential part of training and staff had to go out of the way to find alternate arrangements. And the first award specific for COVID-19 uh, is in recognition of that work. And the award goes to Jennifer Silverthorne, and Victoria Tavares. We now come to the highly commended award. As you know, the patient safety was a great of great concern during the time of pandemic, during a patient's journey. And the highly commended award goes to a piece of work addressing patient safety and writing patient safety guidelines for a patient's journey to, to in, involving a patient's journey in the sector of primary care. And the award goes to Becky Morris. <laughs> Finally, we come to the winner of this category. The winning award goes to a piece of work uh, which partnered with the Groundswell Charity to design and perform and finally analyze uh, a series of interviews with people who were experiencing homelessness in Manchester. This provided the forum for shared learning, which is part of a fundamental ethos of this university. And the award goes to Kelly Howells, Matt Amp and their team. Johnson, the University Public Engagement Manager. Our next award is for the group category. For this category, we have one COVID-19 award, one highly commended and one winner. Our COVID-19 award goes to a group who collaboratively created a booklet targeted at older people who were shielding and isolating. The booklet was a huge success and has even been celebrated by the World Health Organization as best practice for age-friendly cities during COVID-19. The award goes to Greater Manchester Older People's Network. A highly commended group was formed to establish digital methods in patient reported outcome measures. They championed the need for virtual involvement and informed a person-based empowerment feedback intervention for older people with multi-morbidities. The award goes to the Empower Partnership Group. The winner is a group who were established in 2015 as the first centre of its kind in England. This group puts patient experience at the heart of medical education by involving public contributors in all aspects of the delivery, teaching and governance. The centre has trained 3,000 graduates and is recognised for leading practice nationally as well as internationally. The award goes to Double Day Centre for Patient Experience. I'm Angela Ruddock and I'm a public contributor um, and um, I'm here to present uh, for the public contributor category. So for this category we have two joint winners 
um, and won um, COVID-19 award. The COVID-19 award goes to an artist who, in collaboration with Manchester's Maternal and Fetal Health Research Centre, aimed to help break the taboo surrounding sil stillbirth in the Jewish community. They went above and beyond their role for the project, which included facilitating artistic workshops, interviewing researchers, and recruiting a third of all participants. The award goes to Chava Erlanger. The first winner has committed a significant amount of time, energy and expertise over the past decade, volunteering for the faculty's Museum of Medi Medicine and Health. Their voluntary work has been integral to the museum's development and they have continually worked to preserve the collection and make it more accessible to all. Our second winner has been a public contributor for several years and has provided invaluable support to staff, students and other public contributors. Their main aim has been to improve healthcare research by persuading researchers that PPIE is not just good for their research, but crucial for credibility and understanding. They also have been involved in several PPIE groups, supported the training of staff and students, and has contributed on several PPIE papers. They continue to be a great support to staff, students and public contributors alike, including myself. The joint award goes to Peter and Julie Moore and Elsa Donnelly. So thank you everybody who presented the awards and congratulations to all our winners and highly commended. It really is a brilliant um, reflection of the fantastic work that everybody's doing in so many different shapes and forms. And together, of course, it makes the faculty and PPIE what it is and the reason for our celebrations today. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's been a lovely example of the way in which we can still come together in a really positive way. We're so proud of all our public contributors, our staff and our students and the partnerships that we've built with the aim of all improving the lives of millions of people across our local, national and global communities. And I think this afternoon has demonstrated as well as the activity that although we've still got a lot of learning to do about how to do this sort of thing remotely, we can still be very effective and there is still so much positive benefit um, from working in these methods. Sam is going to put a poll on the screen anytime now. Um, so please complete that, this because this will give us feedback about your reflections and thoughts about the event. And that will really help us um, shape what we do in the future. And as we've looked back over the last five years, we also want to look forward to what comes next for PPI in the faculty. So the next steps that we've identified are that we will continue to contribute to the university's public engagement strategy and the faculty's key strategic priorities. We're going to refresh our web pages. And obviously, if we build a resource um, from the activity we undertook this afternoon, we will include that on those pages. We're going to create a charter mark that can be highlighted when public contributors have been involved in our teaching and research activities. We're going to create new resources to support our staff, students and public contributors. And we're going to carry on hosting a range of PPIE events. And we all have been adapting and evolving to the changing situation over the last 18 months. So again, we would love to have your ideas about how we move forwards, what you would next like to see us do, what you would like to um, 
you know, see as the, the priorities. So please get in contact with us. You have Sam's email through the different communications. Um, and we're always very happy to have conversations with, with, with any of you who, who've got ideas. Before we close, I'd like to say a really special note of thanks to the planning group members, our guest speakers, our award announcers, and the hosts of the breakout rooms. It's been a wonderful sort of group contribution to make it a very special afternoon. I'd also say, like to say a huge thanks to Sam Franklin. Sam has overseen the organization of this. She does the technical side. She's coordinated the films and the slides. I mean, how she does it, I really don't know, but it is always absolutely perfect. So Sam, we couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much for all that you do. We want to end by taking a screenshot um, photo of the event. So please, if you'd like to be in the photo, turn on your videos and you'll appear on the screen. So Sam will now um, stop sharing her screen and we'll take the picture. And then Kay, I'm going to pass over to you for a final set of remarks. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, well, that brings the 2021 celebration event to a close. Um, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I really enjoyed myself this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers from today. And um, it just reiterates really what a great and diverse PPIE family we all belong to. Um, I'd like to thank Stephanie for brilliant chairmanship. And of course, everybody's mentioned Sam already. We couldn't do this without her. And Howis as well. Um, they've done a marvellous job putting this event together. And thank you to you all for being here as well. It wouldn't have been the same event if you'd not been here. And so I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. And if not very soon, then this time next year. Thank you.